Thank you, Charlotte. I asked Charlotte to meet my rooms a couple of weeks ago, and I think I sort of freaked her out, but she did a really good job. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about fear. Does anyone know anything about fear? Are they afraid of anything? Just call, call something out. Bias of it is appearing wall. All right, anything else? Spiders? <laughs> Spiders? <laughs> Snakes? Snakes, no. I'm sorry? Cockroaches. Oh, yeah, cockroaches. Failure. failure. Fear failure. Yeah, that's a big one. What else? The dark. Yep. That's very scary for a lot of people. You never know what's around the next corner. Sickness. Yeah. Death. We're afraid of death. What sort of fears do we love? Roller coasters, Stephen King, scary movies. So excitement a little bit more fun when there's some fear involved. Like, oh, I have this great opportunity, but I'm so scared about taking this risk. There's a little bit more fun involved, right? I mean, you get that that extra shot of cortisol or adrenaline or whatever it is. And you know, so we sort of have this love-hate relationship with fears. Um we fear our fear also, right? So maybe something happened and it was in the grocery store in the cereal aisle and some weird dude approached you and held you up with a knife and wanted your wallet. You might associate that fear with cereal now or with the grocery store or with nine o'clock on a Saturday morning when you were there and that happened. And then we get this anticipatory fear. I can't go to the cereal aisle. I can't eat cereal. I can't go to the store at 9 a.m. on Saturday. And we sort of train our minds into that. Um, and then we avoid the situation. We could even become shut in in our houses because we're so afraid of what's out in the world because we slipped on the porch and it was icy, but so we avoided going out in the winter and then it's summer. And then you know, we saw that same step and we had that same jolt. So our fears can build on each other, but often our anticipatory fear is worse than the fear itself of the situation. And I think we've all experienced this over and over again in our lives. The, the ingrained, the reinforcing of our fears, right? Like every time I see a snake, I get afraid. <laughs> see a snake, get afraid. See a snake, get afraid. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. But what's happening? What's the, the physiological aspects of fear? Our fear is based on the amygdala, which is our little bitty lizard brain in the middle. And it releases different hormones that affect our body in very different ways. So our blood pressure drops, our breathing increases, we start to sweat, we have this sense of panic, right? And so uh, it's actually a part of the brain that's common to nearly all creatures that are alive. And that's how old it is, is that it just started way back millions of years ago and it sort of has evolved in different creatures and we all have it, right? Like I step near a snake and the snake rears up, well, the snake's afraid of me. I'm afraid of the snake. It's the same process. Maybe slightly different chemicals, maybe slightly different amounts, but it's the same thing on both sides. Um, and that's what it, that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult is that it's old. It's so old, so ingrained in us and how our ancestors actually were able to survive. Is you go out and you see the tiger, you see the bear near the berry bush and you're like, that's not the berry bush I'm gonna show up, shop at anymore, right? So they stayed alive because of that. They ran, the fight, flight or freeze is all based on this chemical process that's you know so ancient and ingrained in our bodies that it's hard to overcome that process. It's hard to retrain that process once we've started it. But I think there's a lot of different sorts of fears, right? So we have the fear of the snake, the tiger, the bear, the dark. And then we have other fears, fear of death, fear of un unbased accusations these fears that sort of come out of our social circumstances. 
right? So we have sort of these immediate fears. We have personal fears that we have ingrained in ourselves about the, the store and the cereal at 9 a.m. on Saturday, that whatever our personal things have been, we've ingrained that fear. And then we're going to have what I'm going to call cultural fears. And maybe that's a cultural fear of public speaking. Not every culture in the world has that fear. Um, racism. America has a lot of problems with racism, and that's a cultural fear. Poverty, fear of success or failure, and how that's defined in each culture. Uh, we also have a lot of different ideas about what's entertaining as fear, right? That's a cultural sense. If we watch uh, Swamp Man today, you know, we're going to laugh at it. You know, the, the swampy character in the dark that you can barely see anything coming out, like, it's a dude wearing some weird clothes and he's a little wet, right? That's not scary to me. <laughs> but if I go watch The Shining, that's scary, right? So sort of how our, our thought processes culturally have changed over what can incite fear. Uh, someone pointed this out to me. Think about in the movies or in the books or on television, Who's the bad guy? How do they talk? What sort of accent do they have? Right? And I'm going to quote Alan Ginsberg from his poem America in 1957. Them Russians, them Russians, them Chinamen, and them Russians. Right? We have a cultural icon of what is the bad guy, what we should be afraid of. And we've ingrained this over and over again to the point that we don't really notice it. I mean, am I supposed to eat eggs today or not? Are eggs going to cause cholesterol and the high blood pressure and kill me tomorrow? Or can I eat eggs because they're safe and they're healthy and nutritious? I don't know. That's been confusing since I was a child because the television has told me that they're bad, they're good, they're bad, they're good. So now I have a little bit of a fear of eating eggs, right? So we reinforce these sort of things culturally. And we're probably not aware of a lot of them, right? Like... Um, should I be afraid of getting a bad grade in school? Should I be afraid of math? Who's afraid of math? Who thinks they're no good at math? They're just, you know, it's not actually rational. You can learn math just as you can learn to read. You can learn history. Yeah, I'm getting a look. I'm getting a look of, no, that's different. You don't speak math. Well, can you read and write math, though? Right? I mean, like, we have these sort of ingrained things that we've done to ourselves, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, maybe through accidental circumstances, or maybe it's just how our amygdala is wired, right? I mean, I, I would like to blame the fact that I'm Irish that I, on the reason why I'm scared of snakes. We got rid of those snakes. <laughs> For a reason, they're scary. <laughs> but that's not rational. That's illogical, right? There's a lot of things that we do with fear that becomes illogical. Our reactions are illogical. So when we start to look at this a little bit deeper, how do we actually react to that bodily process? Right? Is it like hunger? Oh, I've got to eat. Is it like sleep? I'm too tired to do anything else. I have to sleep. Or is it like desire? oh, I want the big house in East Sacramento with the huge lawn and the pool. I really want that. What is it more akin to? We have a physiological basis, but we also have some cultural basis. We have some experiential basis. So how do we actually make sense of this? Within the Buddhist perspective, I was talking to Geshe Tamshalo about this. And he said, fear is a wrong view. It's not a helpful view. It's a, not a doesn't do you any good. Um, and so many of our practices actually talk about fear and how to confront it in different ways. If we think about the Heart Sutra, um, I'll read the passage. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There's no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom the mind without obscuration and without fear. The first part of that quote is actually talking about the Four Noble Truths, all right? 
But then what are these obscurations? So generally obscurations are sort of what we must clear to find omniscience. In the words of Lingu and Pache, they're the fog that have settled over our minds. So our mind is already clear, but we've just encountered this fog, this smoke, these things that make us not see correctly, these things that have obscured our minds to ourselves. And how these are conceptualized is a little bit different school to school. Um, in the Gaelic school, we have uh, sort of a, a two-part thing. We have cognitive obscurations and emotional obscurations. Cognitive obscurations are those that completely cover or accompany mental activities, so thoughts, which prevent our mind from cognizing the two truths of all phenomena. All right, so the two truths being um, impermanence and appearance. Um, and our emotional obscurations, obscurations that are disturbing emotions and attitudes which prevent liberation. Those are both habits and tendencies. So my habit of being afraid of the store at 9 a.m., my tendency to fear snakes. Arjun Rinpoche gave a great commentary on the Heart Sutra a couple years ago. Um, and he called these uh, dilutive obscurations to liberation, which would be emotional obscurations, and obscurations to omniscience. So dilutive obscurations to liberations, he said, that's the first of our natural, it's our natural thought process, right? So all sentient beings have thoughts of three types, happy, unhappy, apathy, or neutral. Um, happiness can easily change into attachment. Unhappiness can morph into hatred. Apathy or neutral can easily become ignorance. So this, this changing of our, our feelings into poisons um, are delusions or obscurations to our liberation. They're things that we need to clear away. They all devolve into ignorance eventually. And our ignorance is what ties us to samsara. I think that snake is going to kill me, even though it's 20 feet away from me. I'm terrified of the snake. That's my ignorance. The snake isn't going to kill me from 25 feet away. Now, if I'm holding the snake and it's a cobra, then, you know, that's a, a reality. And I think my fear would be much higher. But then what, if, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of losing something. I'm afraid of losing my life. I'm afraid of that loss. And what happens afterwards? Is it actually a terrible thing if I get bitten by the snake? It, yeah. Yeah, on a relative level, it is. On an ultimate level, maybe not so much. Um, our obscurations to omniscience. So those are a higher level of obscurations. So Arjun Pache emphasized that it's really more these knowledge-based things that affect Buddhas, or uh, sorry, not Buddhas, Bodhisattvas and Arhats. So those individuals who have been able to attain a very high level of wisdom, that uh, there's four causes of their ignorance. So ignorance due to distant location. I don't know what's happening in New York right now. Ignorance due to time. I don't know what's happening 20 minutes from now. Ignorance due to the cycle of nature. Well, if I've lived in India and it wasn't summer, then I don't know how hot it feels in India in the summer. And then ignorance due to profundity of objects, objects that you just can't grasp yet. So these objects, obstacles lead to fear in your mind. If I'm afraid that what I'm going to do here is going to affect New York 20 minutes from now. And that's an ignorance. I don't know what's going to happen. So within the Heart Sutra, Arjuna Rinpoche says that that sort of fear and those obstacles on, to omniscience that you have to clear away are very high level. They're not our fear of snakes. Right? They're our fear of the unknown. And we can actually sort of state it that way a little bit closer to home. I don't know what's going to happen in 20 minutes, so I don't want to go anywhere. I'm going to let my fear overtake me about the future. I'm going to let my fear overtake me about what happened in the past. I did this, and that happened, and so now I'm afraid to do anything ever again. 
So the fear in this statement is just such a high level of ignorance that we're not, I'm never going to get there. It, well, maybe, you know, I can hope that I will get there eons from now. But today, I don't need to worry about that so much. I don't need to know what's happening in New York in 20 minutes from now. I just don't need it. It's not worth my energy or my effort to try to figure that out. I don't have enough wisdom to know that, you know, if I spill a glass of water, it may affect something in New York. Actually, I'm pretty sure it won't, but I don't know. Maybe. That's, I guess, when you reach some high level of wisdom, that's actually a fear that you have. Um, Karl Bruhauser, in his uh, book, The Heart Attack Sutra, which if you haven't read, you should. It's great. Uh, in relation to this, to this passage, he says, the more walls we try to build and the more fending off techniques we try to employ, the more our fear increases as we can witness so dramatically in many places in the world. No matter how high we build our walls and fences to keep people out, they we just get more paranoid. Not in my neighborhood. Those sort of cultural fears that we have. He also goes on to say, once we see the lack of real existence of both factors to be relinquished and their antidotes. So what's the truth of our obscuration? What's the truth of our fear? Is that actually, is that snake more afraid of me than I am of it? Probably. Um, there's an increasing sense of fearlessness. So am I okay to hold a boa constrictor even though I'm terrified of snakes? I've done it. it scared the crap out of me, but it was okay. Because it, it wasn't big enough to hurt me. I didn't have that same fear generally afraid, not specifically afraid. And when we realize that there's nothing to be hurt, no I to be hurt, no mine to lose, then there's nothing to hurt us and there's no ground for fear. That is what's called the samadhi of the hero's stride. So in Medicine Buddha practice, um, there's Fear specifically mentioned in regards to the Buddha renowned glorious king of excellent signs, he requests alleviation from fears through this passage. With hunger, thirst, and poverty pacified, may there be wealth. Without torments of body, such as bindings and beatings, without harm of tigers, lions, snakes, with conflict pacified, endowed with loving minds and relieved from fear of flood as well, May we pass into fearless bliss. So without our own immediate fears, the, the animals, the tigers, the lions, and snakes, and conflicts. One thing we didn't really mention was conflicts. How much do we fear getting into an argument with someone or confronting someone? That's a big fear. Once those are pacified, please help us find our loving minds and relief from this fear of this flood of fear, right? It just keeps going. Stop that cycle of reinforcing our fears so that we can find fearless bliss, so that we can just be happy, so that we don't have those obstacles to omniscience. Tara, of course, in Tara practice, there's fearlessness, specifically in the homage, right? Sort of where we're describing how we're intending our uh, mantra to be. Oh, my prostrate to the goddess, foe destroyer, liberating lady Tara, homage to Tare, savorous heroine, with Tutare dispelling all fears, granting all benefits of Ture. With her, to her, the sound Soha, I bow. Again, it's used in meditation manuals, meditation guides. The Ganges Mahamudra, which Lama Jinpa often will read and give on retreats, passage for this is, if you're beyond all grasping at an object and grasping at subject, that is the monarch of all views. If there is no distraction, that is the monarch of all meditations. If there is no effort, that is the monarch of all conduct. When there is no hope and no fear, that is the final result, the fruition that has been attained or realized. So when we think about this, we're thinking about our view, our meditation, and our actions. 
So for view meditation and actions can be easy, can be without distraction, without effort, without grasping, then we can find both no hope and no fear, sort of a contrast of what's in the middle. Uh, Nagarjuna's Precious Garland mentions fear a lot, actually. Um, in particular, there are two passages that I want to read. One is uh, sort of later when he's describing the 57 faults in ethics. So ethics being behavior. Miserliness is the fear of giving, which is sort of a definition of miserliness. When you're grasping at your money, grasping at trying to not, not let anything go. And that's the fear of giving. He also says uh, a little bit earlier, and I'm going to read three verses. It's in the middle verse that is most relevant. Physical sufferings of bad transmigrations, such as hunger and thirst, arise from ill deeds. Bodhisattvas do not commit, commit ill deeds, and due to meritorious deeds, do not have physical suffering in their lives. Mental sufferings of desire hatred, fear, lust, and so forth arise from obscuration. Through knowing them to be baseless, we just quickly forsake mental suffering. Since thus they are not greatly harmed by physical and mental suffering, why should they, bodhisattvas, be discouraged though they lead all living beings in the world? So again, we're talking about our, our grasping and what leads to our own suffering. The question then is, what do we do, right? We have this physical process, this underlying physical thing that happens in our bodies. What do we do? How do we act differently? How do we change? So I was listening to um, a bunch of podcasts and stuff, and fear is a, a fun topic for them, both in talking about fear within movies and how it's portrayed. Um, you can, man, that, I don't have time to watch movies, but like some of their descriptions make me think that would be really fascinating to watch. And then like, wait, they're talking about some movie that's scaring the crap out of people. Why would I want to watch that? Um, but on, uh, I love the hidden brain. I'm going to quote them a, a fair bit at the moment. Um, and what they actually said was fear, what fear steals from us is our sense of control. This is a very Western point of view, right? We can control ourselves. We can control our environment. Something that within Buddhism, we're going to say, well, no, you got to you gotta give that up also. You got to give up that grasping. So within the Western view of what to do about fear is gaining knowledge through learning to help us gain control of the situation. Um, so that's sort of like using logical processes to counter the illogical part of our brain Right, the illogical reactions that we have, and that our anticipated fear is greater than the situation, the experience fear itself. So if we can think through that, I don't need to be afraid about the cereal aisle on Saturday at 9 a.m. I've gone there Wednesday at 2 p.m. and it's been fine. So this seems illogical. Um, there's sort of two uh, types of therapy. There's probably more, but these are two that I'm going to highlight in regards to fear that have uh, apparently been quite successful. One is called cognitive reappraisal, and that's reevaluating the circumstances and the fear or emotional response that came up from that. So it's really changing your fear into something else, right? So, oh, I'm afraid of the cereal aisle because this happened way back when. Well, but what else is happening? Look, there's a, a worker diligently doing his job. It's very clean here. There's other parts of the situation that I can feel good about. I survived that situation. I didn't get hurt. No one got hurt. So it's sort of turning the fear into something else. So if you have a fear of a bully, maybe turning that into the being proud for standing up for yourself. It is a mindfulness action of noticing other parts of the circumstances. Right, so maybe if I see a snake in the woods and I'm like, oh, God, it's a snake again. I can look around. Oh, look at the trees. It's a beautiful day. The smell of pine needles. Uh, you know, I can look at other parts of the situation and not focus on the one thing 
of the whole situation that is fearful or that sort of starts my brain going like this and say, oh, okay, that's over there. There's no problem. I have a beautiful hike. I have a beautiful bike ride. I have a beautiful climb today. I can look at the other aspects and not focus on the fear, not reinforce that as a response. Then there's another version of therapy called exposure therapy, which I think we've all probably heard about. And that's where you sort of slowly introduce the fearful object. So in Hidden Brain, there was actually this great description of um, a therapist who's doing this through AI. So they've got AI goggles and you're just sort of having a conversation with someone and then maybe way off on the wall, there's a small spider. You keep going, you keep doing this therapy and slowly the spider gets bigger, comes closer and you sort of get introduced to that object of fear within the environment, but you've shown that it's safe, that it's still okay. So it's a new learning process for our amygdala for that little lizard brain saying, hey, nothing bad's happening here. Why would I think anything bad's happening? This is good. This is just a little introduction. It's fine. It's not a problem. So we can relearn to not have fear, just as we learned to have fear. I think these are interesting because they are actually taking two different aspects of how we relate to fear, right? Sort of my first object of fear being things that we can't control because they're in our brain versus our learned or our cultural associated fears. And they, they sort of balance that in a different way, in a very similar way that Buddhism does. But at the same time, the underlying thought process, the underlying assumptions are different. I'd rather not go into all of that, but when I ask Geshe Damshala, hey, what would, what would you advise someone who has fear of something to do. He said, well, this is what Jada Rinpoche says. You're afraid of an animal or something that's a little bit more acute. Just calm down. Settle down. Don't escalate the fear. Don't focus on it. Focus your attention onto something else. Focus your attention onto something that's good in the situation. Take a step back. Breathe. Don't just react. And that's sort of the general practice that we do with a lot of meditation stuff, right? We take that space, we meditate so that we have that space between, I'm hungry, I got to eat. I'm tired, I got to sleep. I'm afraid, so I got to run. We take that space so that we can consider our actions. But more generally, you practice the opposite, right? Just like we do with the three poisons. So anger or aggression, attachment, desire, ignorance, and delusion, we practice the opposite of these when they come up. So if we're angry, we practice bodhicitta. If we have desire, we practice impermanence. We do the two truths. So we not only see the good things, but we're open to change. And then with ignorance and delusion, we practice the threefold path, ethics, wisdom, and meditation. Chodron Trumper Rinpoche, in his book, Smile at Fear, which is also another great book, I highly recommend it. Um, he looks at fear in sort of a holistic manner. Uh, and rather than looking at like just fear of snakes or fear of conflict or racism or, or what other sort of cultural or learned fears, he takes them sort of all together. And in a sense, he's using this metaphor of a, as a warrior. Right, So the Shambhala soldier who sees things as they are, exactly as they are, not with our own fears, not without taking a moment, sees ourselves, our actions and our circumstances as they are by simply facing the facts. Well, the snake's over there. The snake's as afraid of, it, as of me as I am of it. We're not condemning. Snakes aren't evil. They're not terrible. They're not horrible. The person who was in the grocery store in the cereal aisle. It's not terrible, not horrible. There's a whole backstory for that person also that we don't know. Maybe they're starving. Maybe their kids are starving. We just don't know. But we don't have to condemn that. We don't have to say this is horrific and it will always happen. But trying to see the situation in its fullest extent. Um, our fears encompass each of the three poisons to a greater or lesser extent, different mixtures. 
And so Trojan Rinpoche imbibes his warriors with bodhicitta, right? They're the, the same warriors from uh, Karl Brumhauser, the same warriors of the Samadhi of the hero's stride. So we have, if we can develop our bodhicitta, if we can develop honest viewing and the wisdom to overcome things, and we just sort of slash, slash off, we peel away the onion, we peel away different layers, Also understanding that we're not self-contained, right? It's not all just up in my mind. It's not just that amygdala telling me what to do. There are cultural things. There are um, being together and these steps that lead us to change, to transformation. Oh, I'm afraid of the cereal at 9 a.m. on Saturdays. Are you autumn? Why not? What happens there? Nothing? Oh, okay. All right. So we can use our community. We can use each other's experiences. Um, and transforming the experience of our phenomenal world, how we actually experience things, how we have, how we put a layer of fog over our experiences. Transforming that from, you know, excesses of passion, aggression, and ignorance into the natural state of trying to clear that fog rather than adding on top of it. Then we get to a fearless state. We get to that that bravery of seeing things as it is. It's hard to acknowledge a confrontation that I don't want to have. It's hard to not be afraid of saying the wrong thing to a six-year-old who's impressionable and might come back in 20 years and be like, oh, remember that day when I was six and you told me that snakes were terrible? Oh, crap. <laughs> right? I mean, how do we actually say, hey, okay, I can't be afraid to interact with any kids because like they're impressionable, but like this is life. This is how we actually go on. I can have that bravery to talk to people, that bravery to say, I'm going to do this with good intentions with bodhicitta. And there might be actions or consequences or karma in the future because of it, but I don't have to be afraid of that. So slowly throughout uh, smile at fear. Rinpoche introduces fears in different ways and really shows our fear of change. We're holding on to past behaviors. I'm holding on to not going to the store at 9 a.m. or not going to the cereal aisle at 9 a.m. on a Saturday because I was afraid at that point. I'm holding on to being fear, afraid of snakes because why? I don't know. I don't know why I hold on to that. Because my brain tells me that all snakes are scary and terrible and going to eat me. That's not logical. So we develop this change through effort and through developing compassion and gentleness and developing our wisdom, knowing more about the situation. Maybe I can identify different snakes better and I know which one can attack at 20 feet. Then I'm not afraid of the rest of them, but that one I might avoid. I go 40 feet away, right? I can change my actions. I can change my mindset, I can change my behavior, but I'm not going to change the fear itself. I can, I can push away the fog, I can blow it away, send it somewhere else. But that doesn't mean that the fear stops existing. My brain is still going to do that thing. But if I've developed the space and I've developed a different mindset, I can be compassionate to myself, I can change my behavior so that I can still feel that, but I can say, whoa, let me act differently than I used to. And that is a big fear also. Fear of change is huge. Have a children in places that scare you. She was a Trojan Trumpet Rinpoche's student. So there's a lot of overlap in these two books. And she actually says something interesting about laziness. We stay fearful because we're too lazy to change. Perhaps we're just comfortable. Perhaps I'm comfortable staying away from snakes. Perhaps I think I'm comfortable staying in my house and not taking a shower because that one time the water is too hot and it hurt and it burned. Perhaps I'm comfortable never confronting anyone. But the path is all about change and all about delving deep into what we're, we'd rather hide away. So having bravery 
to face things as they are, to face our fears. Say, yes, I'm afraid of that. Is interesting. And then we get a Thich Nhat Hanh, who's very community oriented. Uh, his book, Fear, Essential Wisdom for Getting Through the Storm, really emphasizes community. Not isolating yourself in your mind or in your house, and definitely not isolating from your fears. Being together in a community. And he gives four mantras for this. Um, and I, I want to preface this by saying that I think all of these mantras can be used for someone else, to help someone else, to help community, but also for compassion towards yourself. The first one is, dear one, I am here for you. And that's true presence. That's just being present in the moment, being mindful of what's happening, and being there. Maybe you're just there for yourself, and maybe that's the, the moment between your amygdala shooting out hormones and your reaction. Oh, I'm, I'm here for me on this. I, I see the snake. I see the tiger. I am here for me. I can do something. I can make a different choice. The second one is, darling, I know you are there, and I'm so happy for you. And that's recognizing Recognizing someone else, recognizing someone else's fear, recognizing your own fear, even being able just to name it. Oh, I'm afraid on Saturdays, if I go to the store at 9 a.m. and I go to the cereal aisle, I'm going to be mugged again. Recognizing that is huge. And I can be really happy that I can recognize that. The next one is about relieve, relieving suffering. And this one is... Darling, I know you're suffering, and that's why I'm here for you. We're all suffering in some sort of. And I can be here for everyone because they're also suffering. I can be here for myself because I am suffering. And then the last one I think is actually really important for communities, and that's, dear one, I am suffering. Please help. Asking for help. If you don't have anyone to ask for help, then you don't really have a community. But we're afraid to be vulnerable. We're afraid to show this is who I am. This is what I have. This is what I'm bringing to the table. We're afraid of these things. And that's, that's fear. Right? I'm, I'm afraid that if I tell someone I'm scared to go to the cereal aisle at 9 a.m. at the grocery store, that they will laugh at me. Right? Like that's that's fear. But if we go first the, the first mantra, dear one, I'm here for you, we're just present, we're not judging, that's big, and that's not easy. So Thich Nhat Hanh says, these four mantras work to remove fear, doubt, and isolation. They're not complicated or difficult to understand, but you must have courage, wisdom, and joy to practice them. The practice of mindfulness, of meditation, consists of coming back to ourselves to restore peace and harmony. So we can say, I was afraid. And we can go back and say, yeah, I was afraid. And maybe that behavior that I did wasn't great. But I can still have joy that I'm here. I can still have joy that I'm in a community and that I have help. So there's a lot of different aspects of fear. But in some ways, we can think of it just like any other emotion that we have that obscures our thinking, that sort of brings in those clouds of fog and don't let us see how things actually are because we're adding layers of conceptualization and our fear and our happiness. We're adding all these things to the situation. It's not necessarily there, and it's in the situation itself. So when I was preparing for this, I actually read several biographies of people um, in situations that I thought would induce a lot of fear. So a prisoner at Auschwitz, a monk who was in Tibet when China came in, a couple biographies of people who suffered disfiguring accidents or horrific circumstances. And I found it really interesting that most of these did not actually talk about fear very much. They talked about change. They talked about the transformation they acknowledged the fear. Um, however, the fear wasn't highlighted. So why would you do that? Why would we want to highlight 
the fear in our situations? Why would we want to reinforce it in that way and have that be our story that I live in fear? We have suffering. We don't need to increase it. We don't need to suffer our suffering. We don't need to fear our fears. And these biographies were really interesting in that because I kept going, okay, where's where's the terrible part? Where's the horrific, right? I mean, sort of that suspense thriller novel movie thing that you go like, okay, the, the roller coaster's going up to stop. This is really going to be scary. I want off. I want off. But it wasn't there. So these authors chose to describe the circumstances of most of their oppressors in benevolence, right? These people have families, they have other things going on, and the actions they're taking towards me are just one aspect of them. Maybe they're afraid of me because I don't know why. Maybe this is a mutual fear situation. They have someone else saying, if you don't do this, you'll do, I'll do this to you. So almost the ones that I read, they approached their fear with compassion. They allowed themselves to change. They couldn't change their circumstances, but they allowed their minds and their bodies to change. So learning to give ourselves space with our physical feelings, so our, our chemical reactions to things and our emotional feelings and what our perceptions are, that's what we do in meditation. That's what we learn in meditation is to take that time to have that moment to see those reactions and then not just move on them, right? Not just jolt of fear, jolt of excitement, jolt of hunger and eat everything, run away, do this, fight, right? We get that space. And this gap gives us the opportunity to apply our bodhicitta, to apply our compassion, our joy, our love, and have a logical way of processing so that we're not just reacting illogically. And we can take back what fear steal, steals from us. We can take back this reactive behavior, but that's not control. Right? We're not controlling the situation in that case. We're having peace with it. So we still experience fear. We're not going to make it go away. Um, cognitive science and biology tells us that if we chop off our heads, we'll have other problems. But we may not have fear at the moment. We need that, right? We need our brains. Our brains have been conditioned from you know, eons to have this, it doesn't mean that we need to react in the same way that our ancestors did. So in the 90s, who's a child in the 90s? Mm -hmm. There's no fear t-shirts, right? And I had one that said, the only fear is the fear of regret. And that shaped my life for a while. I hate to say that a t-shirt from the 90s shaped my life. <laughs> but how do we transform these things? How do we change our fears? How do we acknowledge them when maybe they're in our cartoons and in our TV shows and we're not aware yet? How do we change ra racism from a basis of fear into loving everyone in our society? How do we change these things? But it takes time, it takes meditation and practice and love and bodhicitta and there's no good answer. I can't give you an answer today that's going to say, okay, if you take steps one through five, you'll be fear free. Um, but, you know, if we're paralyzed from taking action because of fear of change, because of fear of acknowledging who we are, what we are, what we want to do, then we're not going to get anywhere. Um, you know, it's... Uh, Fear is something that is part of life, like hunger, like happiness, like sadness. Death happens, and we can't change that. And actually, we probably don't want to change that. Doesn't mean that we have to react with fear to it. So that's all I have. Um, I'm willing to take some questions or comments. I don't know if I can answer them, though. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. It was really well researched and lots of great ideas in there. Love it. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could 
talk about uh worry and anxiety in relation to it do you see that as like a sort of a synonymous thing that has the same uh, antidotes to it or is it slightly different so this was probably the one question i was afraid of (laughs) okay here's generally when we think about emotions and we think about worry and anxiety stemming from fear and fear as a a base emotion in western thought it's different in buddhist thought so which way do you want to come at this do we want to come at this from fear being a base emotion that spreads out and joins like a color wheel with our excitement with our happiness with our anger then we get anxiety and we get all these other sort of finer refined definitions of how we're feeling or if you look at buddhist thought which is sort of saying we'll find the opposite if you're anxious about something we can go right with fear we can go right to well how do you get unanxious what information do you need what are the circumstances that we can define how can we learn more right how can we make a safe space how can we clear the ignorance? Um, emotional states are either helpful or unhelpful, right? So being anxious about what may happen is not helpful. That doesn't get us to omniscience. That doesn't get us to enlightenment. Um, so it, I think it's still sort of the same idea. Practice the opposite. Right. If you're anxious about something, calm down, find out more information, put in the other pieces to that puzzle so that you can see the picture, right? Gain wisdom. That's my best answer to that one, because I think if we go into Abhidhamma and all sorts of other sort of things, like I, I can't, I haven't studied enough for that, but it's really sort of trying to alleviate the ignorance, change the ignorance from ignorance to wisdom. Okay. <laughs> oh, I just said that works for me and good answer. Yes. Mm-hmm. So all of online can hear. Questions, comments, complaints, fears? Anyone on- online? Are there questions online? I'm not seeing any. Yeah. I think it's kind of interesting how, um, at least in my experience, ignorance that generates fear oftentimes comes from um, a feeling of knowingness, of certainty. Like, I know the way things are. I know that that snake is bad. I know that the airplane's wings are going to fall off in turbulence. <laughs> you know, I, I had that experience here, actually, at the Dharma Center, which was quite interesting. For I had some religious trauma growing up. And I saw a charismatic leader. I saw all kinds of ritualistic behavior. I saw all kinds. Of, I saw a cult, cult. exactly, yeah. and all these weird tankas and statues and stuff. And I was like, I knew that this place was up to no good. Yeah. Like I knew it. You've got the whole razzle dazzle thing. You got the on. whole thing yeah. going on here, right? And I was like, man, I just, I, I know what's happening here. I know, right? And yet, for some reason, I loved the meditation in the dojo, so I just kept coming to that, right? And then it was, in fact, not an intentional application of the anti-fear things that you were talking about, but rather just by being around and observing, I began to see that all that knowingness, that all that, everything I knew to be true wasn't as it was, right? So that experience of seeing like, oh, this doesn't mean what I think it means. The tankas don't mean what they think, what I think it means. The bowing doesn't mean what I think it means, right? And it and it actually continues to surprise me to this day that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything. And yet the fear is definitely subsided as a result of, you know, observing and experiencing it. So I, I don't really have a question around it, but I do think it's it's fascinating how the relationship between this certainty, right? So uncertainty certainly provokes fear, but certainty <laughs> also provokes some fear, 
Yeah. Yeah. That the, uh, the grasping, the not wanting to change, not wanting to see change. That's also a strong motivator. And it, and it's sort of that learned behavior that I was talking about with fear, right? I think we can learn anything. And when we learn something is bad, then we're going to repeat that cycle again and again. It, you know, it's interesting. Some of the literature that I read and some, especially from the Western authors are pretty clear that if you grow up knowing something or being taught something, right? God is the creator. God is the source of all happiness and love and all pain and suffering and blah, blah, blah. Then we have a single point that we're sort of referring back to on things, right? Oh, I know this. I've experienced this. And so that's how it must be. But when we try to sort of change our, our base assumptions, finding them out as we go along can be shocking sometimes, right? Like, oh, it's, you know, there's a lot of pictures here. There seems to be bowing to weird, like, what is going on? We have these base assumptions that devotion and happiness and joy must look a certain way, right? You got to sing and be happy. And, and that's how we show our happiness, not through devotion, through making offerings, through giving. There's sort of a different um, conceptual construct that we have. And we grasp at that, we, we fail to change. And then we do change. And that's pretty cool. But we can always change. I mean, change is the only constant that we really can rely on, is that what's, what's here today may not be here tomorrow. Through the arising of things, that same arising implies the disintegration. And that's tough to get your mind around, especially when it comes to social things or societies or, or things that we think are absolutely true, right? I know that this is how it happens. That's what happens on Saturday at 9 a.m. in the cereal at the grocery store. I know it. But being open to that change is, is tough. So being open to a conceptual change is tough. Yeah. Okay. Online or you? Online or you? All right, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I like, just because we're talking about, right, change, fear of change kind of stuff. Um, I had a Darshan with Lama. We kind of talked a little bit about that stuff, about impermanence, because I kept thinking impermanence, right? Things are going to fall apart. Things are falling apart. Coming apart sucks. <laughs> but he was like, oh, and this is kind of cool to me, was like that same impermanence is also what brings things together. So it's really beautiful, too. Mm -hmm. Um and it's helped my relationship with impermanence. So it was a little, little something to say there on it. Oh, well, that's great. Thanks, Eli. Anyone else? Any online, online yikity yaks? No? Oh. Another little cool thing about impermanence that Lama shared with me is also the bad things also go away too mm -hmm. right so it's like when we think about really awful things those things are also impermanent so we'll flip it around yeah all right well while i still have your attention let's go on to my, uh, some announcements i think we're done <laughs> i'll wrap up my fear of having a good conclusion and go on to announcements yeah all right um, so there's a letter that went out yesterday to most people um, about Mongolia and Kala Chakra. Uh, I would really like to be able to go to that and to help represent Lion's Roar and Lama Jimpa. Um, Jada Rinpoche is giving Kala Chakra and Palm Rent in August in Mongolia, um, but I'm poor. <laughs> so I need some help from the community to be able to do that. So I'm hoping to raise some money. Um, you can talk to me or Lama or Patty or something about that. But we can, if we can raise money through Lions Roar, Lions Roar sponsors it, then that would be great. Um, it's an amazing opportunity. It's the full empowerment. So I'd be there for about a month um, and then bring that back here. And also hopefully ask Jodor Ravishay to come and give the same empowerment here in Sacramento at some point in the future. Uh, another announcement is uh, we have a booth at Pride. There's some sign-up sheets. Uh, please sign up if you're willing to help with that. 
give Matthew Cruz a call. His number's on the sheets if you have any questions. I uh, guess you don't should be teaching this Thursday at six. Everyone's welcome. We are starting a new text, the foundation of all good qualities. So that should be a lot of fun, uh, followed by meditation. Uh, Kongshu, sorry, Kenshu Rinpoche. Uh, he was here a couple of years ago, maybe last year, and did um, Bajarigini. He's going to be here again the 14th and 15th of June. Um, and we're going to do, I think, a talk on the four classes or four levels of Tantra, and then also Vajrasattva, um, Doji Sampra. So Vajrasattva Tantra is over there. Um, so that's going to be a Jainong, not the full wing, but a Jainong. So that's also awesome. Uh, men's group is um, loosely gathering, if you so choose to loosely gather. I don't know. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, and then Lama's birthday is in June, right? So there's been a group that's been doing uh, Guru Rinpoche mantras on Saturday evenings at 7. I'm looking at you because I think you know the answer to this. Okay, yeah. So if you want to help do mantra accumulations together as a group, that's great. Um, Saturdays, check the calendar. I guess this was the best idea. But you can also do them on your own and submit the counts to Dev Deets. Yeah. Uh, if you have questions about that, see Jen, Patty. They're sort of spearheading that as far as I know. Uh, I don't have any other announcements. Does anyone else have announcements? I want to reiterate. Don't make Matthew and I be the only people tabling for pride. <laughs> sign up, sign up, sign up. Uh, I will be marching in the parade and then going straight to our table, wherever it may be. So come out, come out, come on down, come on down. Wear sunscreen, bring water. <clears throat> pride is on Capitol Mall. So the usually you can fold, they have different gates along Capitol Mall, but it's between... Um, usually third and 10th is 10th, the street that runs right in front of the Capitol. I think it's 10th. Um, so yes, so it's on Capitol mall. It begins, um, it's Saturday, June 8th and Sunday, June 9th. And I believe the, I believe it starts at 10 AM. Uh, the parade is Sunday at 11 AM. And as soon as the parade, uh, and dead ends at the March at the festival. So I'll just roll right in and, and uh, uh, table. If you're interested in going, definitely contact mm -hmm. Matthew. I heard something about some free tickets or cheaper low cost tickets. So I would give Matthew a call on that. Definitely give Matthew a call. <laughs> I don't know anything. I'm assuming Matthew will let me know. Um, but yeah, it is a fundraiser. It's the largest fundraiser for the LGBTQ uh, LGBT center in Sacramento. So they do charge a fee to um, go into the festival. But just so you know, it's a nonprofit and they put that money to good services, uh, including uh, uh, combining their services with Wind Youth Services, which does a lot, a lot of outreach to uh, homeless queer youth in Sacramento and providing them with not only shelter and care um, and goods, but also uh, gets kids into the house at 21st and P Street that you see with the pride steps. That's a house that uh, kids who have been kicked out of their homes and 40% of youth on the street are LGBTQ have been kicked out of their homes. They get in there and uh, get them through either GED or job training or, you know, whatever is necessary to get them to hopefully stay there six months and not longer and get themselves on their feet. So. Let's do dedication. <clears throat> Let's. Ready? Here we go. Request to turn the wheel of Dharma. Oh, my. I'm on. I got problems today. Okay, ready. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has not arisen dim not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. 
all-powerful Chen Rezin Tenzin Gyatso please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Ave Loki Deshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losong Dragpa, I make requests at your holy feet. Oh, my God.